Hello everyone, my name is Dr Matthew Clark and I am a trainee in uh, diagnostic neuropathology based in the UK and also I work as a clinical lecturer which means that my training program allows my time to be split between 50% um, of my time is spent in research and 50% of my time is in clinical training. Um, so it's a very exciting opportunity um, to engage with research. And I'm delighted to be talking to you today about expanding research horizons and general research methodologies. So some hints and tips and advice from me, from my experience throughout my career so far um, that have been passed on to me from colleagues as well, which will hopefully be of some help to you as well going forward. So in today's talk, I'm going to first of all to outline the importance of research, really, and why we should engage with research. So some of you may be listening to this wondering about whether you want to actually get involved in it as part of your career. So hopefully I can expand on some of the benefits of doing that. Also looking about what existing opportunities um, exist out there at the moment and what can I actually learn from it? Are there any personal benefits that I can get in my career um, as opposed to also giving benefits to those patients or others who may benefit from the research directly also? We can talk about exploring funding opportunities and how to think about budgeting for research um, and also thinking about formulating a research question. What do I actually want to go into research to look at um, and how do I make that decision or explore that a bit further? Also thinking about the importance of communication, um, communicating amongst a team of researchers, but also communicating with the general public about what you uh, what you do within your research field. And then finally, a little look about my own um, career in academic pathology so far, um, some of the processes I've been through, some of the challenges, and what lies ahead for me as well, which may help to, um, again, shape and provide you with an opportunity to think about the options that may be available to you going forward as well. So first of all, let's think about the importance of research. Well, I think it's a really exciting time in pathology to be thinking about a career in research or be involved in it already. And I think there are several reasons for this. Um, one of them is that we're very much in the era of molecular pathology. And this is very exciting because we're now understanding a lot more about the molecular complexities of different diseases and whether that be cancer or non-cancerous types of diseases across all different organ systems. And I think each year numerous papers come out from different research teams exploring these different complexities, which potentially can make a difference to the patient outcomes as well who, and patients who are suffering from these. So more knowledge in this area is really helping us to advance our specialty. We've also got really um, exciting programs such as digital pathology and artificial intelligence, which is being spoken of a lot in the news at the moment, both positive and negative sides of things. But expanding in research into these different areas is certainly changing diagnostic practice, certainly in the UK and other countries around the world, um, allowing us to use different formats of um, diagnostics, changing our daily practice and our diagnostic strategies as well, which ultimately are helping to benefit our patients who are at the other end of this process. I think we've also got to face some changes, uh, challenges affecting our population. So there are certainly rising frequencies of cancer. I think the quoted figure from um, organisations now is that one in two of us will experience cancer at some point in our life. So there's a real demand and need for us to understand more about these different diseases and how we can potentially treat them or ultimately also prevent them from starting in the first place. I think another important aspect is ensuring that once we make our discoveries and do our research into these different areas, it's important that we translate that. So building the bridge between our research and our clinical translation to make sure that patients get the benefit from this important work, but also continuing to change and evolve our practice. We as pathologists are always looking for new and efficient ways of doing things to help improve our diagnostic protocols or the way we can make a diagnosis. And research can really contribute to that, whether that's by new different techniques or new strategies that can be implemented in progress as well. But ultimately, again, it's improved outcome for our patients that we may be looking to see, um, to whether that be improved survival um, in terms of uh, cancer a diagnosis or potentially finding kinder treatments that don't leave patients with so many um, longer term effects as a result of it as well. I think one of the other things that we need to think about are increasing threat from pandemics and also anti antimicrobial resistance, which are also presenting interesting opportunities for exploration within research. So there are many different avenues within pathology that could potentially you could potentially get involved in um, and explore a lot further as well. 
and also generally a gen more general principle of the aging population as we get older there are certainly more challenges in terms of different disease spectrums that we may encounter neurodegeneration for example in my field of neuropathology is a particular issue and so understanding more about these processes and what happens as we age are also very valuable um, to go uh, for, for us in the future also so why should I ultimately engage with research? Well, I think it can provide you with a lot of valuable skills, again, depending on what type of research that you may go into. I think there are fantastic opportunities for developing communication skills, both within the small group and team setting, but also the wider science community of actually delivering talks and presentations about your research, but also written communication and actually putting together publications that ultimately are going to um, be a summary of your research and showcase that um, for the scientific community to review. I think also you you can get some fantastic wet lab skills. So when I was doing my PhD, I undertook all the wet lab experience myself, starting from scratch, having never done it before. And that's provided me with a really valuable set of skills in understanding a lot about how these processes such as DNA sequencing and RNA sequencing are, are undertaken, so that if there are any problems in the clinical setting, I can potentially give some insight into how that could be improved or developed. But also we're, we're seeing a lot of big data at the moment. So there's a huge volume of data that are coming from different avenues within research. And having the skills such as bioinformatical skills to analyze these is going to be something that potentially could come from research and may actually be changing some of the training of our, you know, for our jobs in the future as well. I think it's also if you've got a particular interest in a topic or area and a research question that you want to answer that you don't think anybody has addressed previously, this represents a really exciting opportunity for you to engage with that and potentially make a difference and find an answer to that. In my experience, you may come into it with one question, but actually end up by the end of it having about 20 others that you want to answer as a result of it. But I think that's one of the exciting things about research is that it can open up many different doors to you um, in the future for future research questions that you or your colleagues or people you're supervising may want to explore as well. I think that's a really op important opportunity to work with a diverse team of people. The research team that I'm part of, where I'm based at, in the glioma team, headed by Professor Chris Jones at the Institute of Cancer Research, we have a large team of around 15 to 16 people, but each one has a different skill set and a very valuable perspective. So when we have our weekly lab meetings, it's really nice to see everybody in the team being able to put forward their perspective based on the, their skills and experience and potentially thinking about an avenue that you hadn't considered before with your results. Really important opportunity for national and international collaboration and research cannot proceed without good team working and good relationships with other teams, both in this country and around the world. And there are also opportunities for you to do, undertake secondments and actually visit different teams in countries and spend some time in different centres as well. One such example that the Royal College of Pathologists is involved with at the moment is the ARISE programme, um, exploring research or helping to support research into sickle cell anemia. And they, this helps to facilitate secondments across the UK, USA, Portugal, Nigeria, Angola, just to name a few of those. And if you want to see a bit more information about that, do visit the college website. So there are lots of opportunities for you um, as an individual um, at benefits to get involved in research as well. But I also think there's a wider importance. So there's an opportunity to enhance your specialty. I think you'll be hard pressed to find another specialty like pathology where we're such a cutting edge specialty where things are developing and adapting and moving very quickly based on the new things that are being discovered each year. There's a real opportunity to discover something new and make a significant clinical impact. And I'll talk about some of that experience from my own perspective later on. But it also gives you a lot of variety within your career. Um, it's another, this, again, the diversity that we see within pathology, whether you're engaged in clinical tr clinical work, teaching, adding research into that provides another dimension to the many skills that you can have within your career and the vast experience that you can develop. Um, I think research and clinical practice is really vital, even if perhaps you don't get in or you're not leading research, having a real appreciation for research is really important to see the specialty develop and at least do the do make sure that you're aware of it so you understand how you can benefit your patients directly from that that exposure and that appreciation of it. And supporting the next generation, certainly in the UK at the moment, in terms of academic pathology, we're, we're in a very challenging situation where we're struggling to get trainees engaged with this. 
So there is a real need and desire to think about the next generation and ensure we've got a healthy um, a healthy population of trainees and other researchers who are still getting involved in it um, to maintain this vital part of our work going forward as well. I think that it's also important that we keep in mind that research can lead to better outcomes for patients. And this is just a slide demonstrating how this can be very actively seen in certain research teams. So the team I'm part of work in um, high-grade gliomas in, pediatric, in the pediatric setting. And each week I attend a multidisciplinary team meeting where I listen out for any patients where they, who may be diagnosed with one of these tumors. And when the operation is scheduled to happen, a member of our team are invited to attend and we can collect a small sample of the tissue from this, rush it back to the lab in some special media, and then grow these cells in different flasks. And that allows us to perform real-time tests, including drug screens, um, but also full molecular profiling of it. And this data can then be fed back to the treating oncologists as well. So there are, this is just one example of the many different ways that research can actually benefit patients. So what are the challenges of it, though? What may be the reasons why people are not so keen to engage with it? Well, I think the top one, I don't have enough time for all of this, is a particularly pertinent one at the moment. And I'm sure wherever you are in the world, um, there are big challenges with the health service. And we're, we all have very busy jobs and demanding jobs at the time. So how can we how can we manage this? I think thinking about work-life balance is really important. And even when you take on research and are engaged with research, it's important for your own well-being to make sure that you have a have a life outside of your clinical work and your research work for your own um, for your own safety and your own well-being. I think the impact of the pandemic has been incredibly significant. So many research centers had to close and labs were shut down as well, which meant that research couldn't proceed as much as it um, as, as we would have liked. And that was a, necessity, a necessary requirement given the circumstances we were facing. But as a result of that, we're now facing challenges in terms of limited funding, where the charities perhaps weren't able to uh, gather as much of the funding that we need um, because of the li limited opportunities to engage with people. But also now with rising costs of the cost of living crisis, there are additional challenges that we're facing in that the demands of the different components of research are also costing us more. I think also one of the big challenges is if you make the decision to engage with research, how do I find the route into it? Um, and knowing where to start can be a particular challenge as well. And also the balance of clinical and research practices also can be quite difficult to understand. And for many of us, of course, we want to do a good job at everything we're doing, including the research side and finding the optimal balance between the two um, can be quite difficult. So I think these are some of the challenges to actually consider and have a think about when you're making that decision. Perceptions of research is really important. And one of the, the, the common things that people feel about research is that there's a need to publish in high impact journals all the time. And I think that everybody has that perception of pressure with it, um, but also the need to publish a specific number of journals each year. And I think the, impo the important thing is what you want to get out from your research as well. And I wouldn't get too weighed down by these particular, these particular perception of pressure in the research community. I think ultimately you want to enjoy what you do. Um, and if you can support research in any way, whether that's reviewing slides, reviewing different material, helping help in the research as a member of the research team, this is something that certainly can give you a lot of satisfaction from an, a, a, an enjoyable and a very productive research career. I think there's a perception of competition as well, and there can be competition existing between different teams who may be working on similar similar uh, research pro processes. Um, so that's something that can put people off as well. Um, there can be challenges, of course, with no funding being available or several rejections from different grant applications. So the perception of why should I bother can often be um, it can often dominate the mindset. But I would strongly urge you, there are these challenges, but certainly from my perspective and my experience and those of my colleagues, it's been an extremely satisfying part of my career. Um, and I look forward to engaging you with it um, as I continue through it as well. And hopefully you will do the same. So communication and research is a vital component um, to ensure that we know that the work that we do is actually known about. And that's both within the scientific community, the clinical community, and also for the general public. 
public engagement work is a vital part of this and this is something I really enjoy and it's lovely to see the interest on in the general public's faces when we talk about what we're doing and they they understand about the different techniques that we're using and the results that we're actually getting and it's also really wonderful to go into schools and talk to children and college students about this and actually maybe inspire people to think about research as a career option for them going forward as well communication also extends to attending scientific congresses and meetings which are vitally important for ensuring that you can network with different people working in different research or related research areas um, that may provide you with a good collaborative opportunity but also to showcase your research and that can be quite nerve-wracking to stand up in front of the the uh, respected researchers of that particular community but it's also really important to get their perspectives on different aspects of your results and maybe give you information or advice about things that you hadn't particularly thought about as well it's also a really good opportunity to support the charities who do a huge amount of work to raise funding for for research to proceed um, and provide the funding the much needed funding which we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do without it so engaging with them, attending the events that they put on to help support research is really important part of the job as well. Um, and that includes supporting the funders, including the general public. The general public donates a huge amount of money to research each year, and that's a particular struggle even at the moment with the um, cost of living crisis. But it's important that we show them what we're actually doing with that money. And so engaging with those research, uh, those public engagement events is a, a really valuable way of giving something back to them to show your appreciation for it. And one of the other ways that love it or hate it, um, social media is an opportunity for you to improve this, whether that's with the other rest of the scientific community or, or, or with the general public as well. I think teaching and research, teaching is something I love, um, and I think this is intrinsically linked with research. I think whether you, whatever aspect you're involved with it, I think teaching is a vital component that actually helps you to develop as a researcher, but also helps those that you're engaged with the teaching as well. Um, there are vital over overlapping skill sets and knowledge that you can develop from it. Um, again, improve communication skills, which help you with your presentations in the future. It inspires different thoughts and ideas. And the amount of times I've been teaching people who've come up with a thought that I hadn't considered or a question that I hadn't thought about before that I perhaps didn't know the answer. And that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad reflection of you as a teacher. That's us as generally. And it's important to go away and take that away and think about it and find out what the answer might be related to that. So I strongly urge you to get involved um, and there's huge benefits to your own research pro progression as a result of that. Um, and again, this is just some, some photos of examples of public engagement work that I've been involved with throughout my career. Um, opportunities of showing people the work that you do. There are some some of the molecular techniques that we've been involved with in my research. Of it's it's amazing how artistic some of these outputs actually are. For example, some of the immunofluorescent stains. Um, so it's really nice to be able to showcase these to the public who are genuinely interested in what you're doing. And like I said, for those in the college stages or even at um, high school stages or younger, this may be the opportunity for you to showcase to them what you do and inspire the next next generation to enter research or even medicine and pathology in the future as well. So social media in, in research, I, I am on, on different social media platforms um, and I, I try to showcase my research that I'm involved in when I can as well. And many of the journals actually do have a social media presence also. So I think that's something important to think about. And certainly they publish, they will notify, put notifications about, about key publications that they've got in that particular week or that month. Um, so it's a good opportunity to see what's actually going on in the research field. And many of the research teams themselves actually have um, social media accounts Accounts. So it's a good idea to actually see what they're actually up to, what they're publishing, but also potentially reach out and make a link or a collaboration um, as a result of that as well. And I know many different pathologists across the world who've actually had success as a result of that, and even some that have never actually met, but have actually published papers together um, through, that, um, through that networking. Um, it's certainly, as I mentioned, the important supporting the charities and the funders. These are just a few um, examples of posts that I put on Twitter um, a few years ago about the work that I've been doing to support um, different charities. Um, and so it's, again, it's a nice opportunity for you to showcase what you do, show your thanks to the charities, but also to highlight to the wider public about the work that's going on related to that um, and get them engaged and potentially help to raise some money um, to support the ongoing work that they, they do. And also it's an opportunity for you to showcase the publications and work that you're doing as well and actually 
reach out to show the general public how um, how productive you are with your research, what you've actually discovered, um, but also again to the scientific community to get their feedback about your paper or your presentation um, and other information. And as I mentioned, different networks exist out there as well, um, potentially ones that can help you actually get get involved in research in the first place. So although, as I mentioned, it's a bit of a love-hate situation with social media, it can also bring you a lot of benefits to you personally, but also in the extent of your research as well. So let's move on now to think about the research question at it, at itself and how you might start off thinking about this. So I think one of the key things is to think about what is my particular area of interest, and that may be related to the specialty that you actually work in. Um, as a trainee in pathology, you may find there's a particular area of um, your, your training that you've, you find particularly interesting. And I think this is one of the key things to actually latch on to. Some people can get involved in research, but into a topic that actually is not something that they are particularly interested in. I think this makes it even more challenging to actually engage with and progress, particularly if you don't have a particular passion for that particular area. So I would strongly urge you to think about something that you are you're interested in and you're keen to work on a bit more and do more reading and work around. Otherwise, it can be a bit of a, a bit more of a challenging identify a particular area of need is a good place to start as well so have you come across anywhere within your experience where you think there is a need where we're maybe deficient in certain certain areas so just as an example with cancer research which is where i'm working in um, for example, that we we see a lot of funding and a lot of research going into those cancers that perhaps are more frequent, such as breast cancer and prostate cancer. But there are also much cancers that perhaps are much rarer, but also have a worse prognosis. So things like pancreatic cancer and um, brain tumors. So maybe thinking about those areas as potential areas of interest or potentially exploring research opportunities within that. Think about what your testable hypothesis is as a result of this, this question. And is there actually an opportunity for you to perhaps get some preliminary data to, or anything that might support why you're thinking along these lines of this particular research question? That can certainly be helpful when you're thinking about applying for grants or collaborations where you can showcase some of the work that you've done already. It may be some work that someone else has already done and um, that you may be working, someone you may be working with. But either way, it's important if this does exist to try and um, make use of that and use it as an opportunity to build your project up from from those those those, those beginnings. Know your field as well and explore current research. So has this actually your question been looked at before? Look, do an important literature review, see what's actually been published in that area, and also speak to the people that are actually working in that area. Do they know of any current research that's ongoing in that particular field? Have you identified an area of, of need or a gap of, in knowledge which might benefit um, others if you could explore that in a, in a research setting? Another question to think about, is there an impact on patients? You don't have to get involved in um, in research that's clinical. It can be very much non-clinical research, which doesn't actually provide any sort of input into the diagnosis or treatment or um, care for a, a, a live patient. But um, it's one of the things to think about what your outcome is and what your end goal is from, from engaging with this research and who might actually benefit from that, whether that's the profession as a whole, whether it's something perhaps related to teaching, that um, it may be something related to training that could come from this. There are lots of things that could potentially benefit others from this work. And so thinking about what you want to get from it is really important. And is there scope for it to be developed further? Can you see this branching into a subsequent bigger project, perhaps starting off as a smaller one that may then translate into perhaps a PhD project or something beyond that? Um, having these ideas about where you see it potentially developing and how you would um, how you would like to plan it. But also, as I mentioned, talking to others in the field is really vital and valuable opportunity with this. There are many people, particularly if you're very junior and you haven't perhaps engaged with the research before and are thinking about dipping your toe in to see what it's like, talking to others about this and thinking about plans related to that is going to be really crucial and really important. So for me, as I mentioned at the beginning, I think there are three key topic areas to think about in terms of pathology at the moment. So I think molecular and genomics, digital and artificial intelligence provide a wealth of different opportunities to get involved in research. And as I mentioned, each year there are so many different new molecular characteristics that have been discovered in the field where I work in brain tumors. There are different subtypes that we're constantly developing. But there is a big need in relation to that. We still are lagging behind in terms of our treatments. So there is a big, big aspect of, um, although we're understanding more about tumors and how they develop and 
their molecular characteristics, we're still lagging behind in terms of the treatment opportunities for this. And certainly we're just venturing into the beginning of artificial intelligence now and using programs where potentially we don't have to perhaps count mitoses or we can, instead of um, making a subjective ass assessment of a proliferation index marker on immunohistochemistry, developing these things there are lots of other ways that artificial intelligence could be used as well but having these skills is going to really help us in terms of making sure that we give a much more objective um, diagnostic approach within our in our daily practice as well so thinking about those sort of principles to help guide your question are going to be really important so what preparation should you think about before you begin if you've made the decision that you want to move forward with this this question what should you do next well, my key advice as well is to give yourself plenty of time to prepare it. So I think we, when we're thinking about grant applications and proposals, um, it's amazing how quickly deadlines can come round. So make sure that you've got plenty of thinking time. And when we're when we're under pressure, we've got lots of different deadlines and demands coming from our clinical aspects of our work. It can be difficult to find the actual headspace to think about these things properly. And they do require a lot of time, a lot of thought and a lot of planning. So do give yourself plenty of time in advance to help with that. Speak to those who've been through this process before. So speak to those who have experience. They may have useful insights about what may, may be needed in applications, what you should and shouldn't say, how you should say things, um, and get, get give people opportunities to actually read what you've put together. Does this seem a sensible idea and does it have any traction to move forward with at this stage? Think about who you might want to work with as a result of that. That may be the opportunity of working with someone you've really admired or read a lot of their research before. Um, and this may provide you with an opportunity to link into their work and maybe even do part of their lab as a result of it. But also think logistically about who is actually doing some work um, or has the skill sets that may you may be needed with in, um, to actually help advance this research further as well. So think about who you may need to get in touch with and look at the feasibility of potentially linking up and networking with them. What resources will I need? Where will you actually do the research? Um, these are important things to think about, um, and particularly if you're if you're applying for things like PhD projects, or uh, so where, where which centres are you going to do that with, and what are the team like that you're potentially applying for uh, applying to work with, or is this a project that's actually going to be undertaken within your clinical department, and that will be done um, when you, in your your spare moments after your clinical work that you're undertaking has been completed. And do you have the things that you need within that within that setting to be able to advance the research as you would like to? Um, so I think think about those things uh, a, a, as an important way of planning, and then that can help guide you when you're thinking about budgets and grant applications as well. Um, well, how much time will I have to do this? And I think, as I mentioned in my position at the moment, having completed my PhD and now with a clinical lecturer position, I have dedicated time, which is available to me entirely to focus on research. Um, so at the moment, I'm on a clinical placement. Um, but then after that, I will have six months of time where I'm, I'm completely in the research setting. So having that dedicated time to do this is really beneficial and allows you to really focus on, on the research aspects of it. So think about whether you've got time to do this, how that time could be um, could be provided within your current setting and speak to those people in your in your team to see whether that may be applicable as well or those that are, are responsible for your training. What are the funders requirements and priority areas as well? So if you're thinking about putting together a grant application, look at, make sure you look in advance about all the different aspects of that application and what are required. It's amazing how many times you hear of people that have um, missed something and only realised at the very last minute, requiring a lot of signatures from various different people. So give yourself plenty of time to look at all the components of the application process um, and to make sure that you're not going to miss anything and you can all you can do it all in a timely manner. And again, finally, think about clinical research versus non-clinical research. So I'm very much in the clinical research setting, but there are other avenues of research that are not in that setting as well. And as I mentioned, you could do something very different. So it could be research related to medical education or something else related to that that may benefit training for the future. These are all aspects of research that can be really helpful for our specialty going forwards. So whatever aspect that you think about or you may be interested in, um, do think about pursuing it and how you can get find ways to make it a reality. So what about constructing your proposal? So I think structure and organisation is really important with this, and there will be guidance available to you when you're putting this together if it's part of a larger grant application. 
I think having clear stated aims about this is really important. So make sure you understand what you want to get from the project, what your outcomes are likely to be. If you've got preliminary data available to you, that may help to showcase what you think you're going to, how the project's going to proceed and what you're likely to come from it. So I think reading through it and making sure that it makes sense and that you can see a sort of pathway of where you're going to your final goal is really important. As I mentioned before, the literature review is going to be a key component to this. So think about when you're reading different papers, making a little summary of what each of the key points each one has um, and bringing those all together into your introduction to your project is going to be really important. So reading those papers and engaging with it, seeing what other people have done related to this maybe is, is a crucial part of it. Um, show, and as I said, showcase any work that you've already undertaken. So if you've already got some preliminary data, then there's an opportunity to show that um, and show the results that you've got if you think they're relevant to this and the progress of the uh, progress of the project. There are often limited word counts with these questions. So be be very succinct and critical. Um, and so make sure that you 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 don't take up valuable words um, by um, and waffle too much because again, make every bit that you put in there should be vital and valuable to the progress of your proposal and your project so make sure you get the key messages across you stay succinct but also include all the information that's required and think about peer review before submission a lot of the um the schemes also ask for collaboration um ask for information about collaborators and others that may be involved in the project so and they may require letters of support from those as well so use that as an opportunity to engage with these but also bid support schemes as well where they may provide you with an opportunity to submit your proposal in advance for someone to actually have a look at and provide some advice about that and that could be a useful opportunity for you to get some early feedback about it Think about your methods as well. Um, what will you need to do to actually get the answers you seek? So think about if you're doing something clinically related or um, how many cases might you need to gather and where are you going to get them from? Do you need to set up? Is it going to require is it as data transfer or is it actually material that you want to get? Um, and do you need to have data transfer agreements or material transfer agreements in place? And from my own experience, these can take a long time. One I've recently been involved with has taken over a year to get in place. So these things can, it's important to engage with them early and think about these things at an early stage. Think about the ethics of the project as well. Do you need ethical approval? And do you, do you need to apply for that as well? Because that is an important aspect that would be asked about within your proposal as well. So do give that some consideration. Think about anything that's perhaps novel or specialist tests that are being used at the moment that may be actually quite new um, that haven't been engaged much with research at the moment. Is there an opportunity where you can see an avenue for your project to include one of those? It doesn't have to, but it's an opportunity to you for you to engage with some new technology. Um, then that might be a, a, a good, a positive selling point from it as well. And getting the expertise of others who are perhaps leaders in the field that you're potentially trying to work in as well is going to be valuable and also give your project some support um, as a potential collaborator and will be will be a useful strategy and create a workflow through the project so many of the proposals will ask you for a, a timeline of how you see it proceeding over the particular period of time where the grant um, that you're applying for may be um, may be available for so make sure you have a clear strategy about how you will deal with that that aspect and how each aspect how long each aspect may take to actually complete now budgets this is a, a key aspect of this um it's one of the, the, the most important thing a lot of what we're applying for is centered around this um but it's also important to get it right um be realistic about what you're actually asking for um, and do the sums think about the costs of different aspects of the work you're doing um, you may be applying for a grant that is only going to cover part of the work that you're doing so be very clear about the parts that you think you're going to be covering um, provide all the details of the costing so the different components whether that's reagents um, expertise from another center provide all these finer details from this um, consider the timeline in relation to the budgets as well, particularly if you're only going to get part of the grant for one year and then uh, following that up with another um, aspect of the grant in the second year. So think about how you proportion that grant. 
um, and remember to submit approvals to your organization in advance. So if you're part of a particular research center, when you apply for grants, you often need to submit a, a, a make them aware that that's what you're applying for, because they need to, again, give their approval and assignment to that. So make sure that you, you do this well in advance of when you're up before your submission date to make sure that the financial officers can give their signature and approval to this process. Um, Think also about, you'll be asked within your application about where else you're seeking funding um, and don't limit yourself. Look at the other opportunities from other grant funders as well. Um, and you're perfectly within your rights to apply for different grants from different centres um, to help support your, your project. But you will be asked about whether there are existing grants that are helping to fund the project ongoing as well. So a really, really important aspect of the, the proposal um, and really easy to overlook some of these finer details. But I think the more detail that you can provide with this and use their guidance that they provide as a help, helpful hints, um, but do give this the dedicated time that it actually needs. Then think about your, you'll be asked about your anal analysis and outputs. So how are you going to actually analyze your data? Is this something you're going to do yourself or is this something that you're going to require from another team member or perhaps a collaborator? Um, think about the methods that you might need from this. So is it using bioinformatics and the different bioinformatical programs such as R? Do you have the skills to do that or are you going to be learning that? Um, think about these things to include within your proposal as well. Where will the data be stored? What's the security related to that? But also GDPR issues as well. These are all things that um, when funders will be keen to know um, and is an important aspect of research that can very easily be forgotten, but is a crucial aspect that we need to make sure that we're promoting the research integrity of the work that we're doing. Thinking about plans of publications and presentations, you may be asked about that where what you how you plan, plan to actually publish and how you present want to present your work, where might it be presented um, and yes, where will it be published potentially as well. Um, but ultimately as well, think about the key selling points and what are the outputs of this project? Is this something that's going to benefit patients or who else may this benefit? Is it or is it something that will benefit the profession? Um, and think about how quickly um, this will be realized. Is this something that potentially could be utilized within the next month or is it going to be a longer process that may require a clinical trial or other approvals before it can be put into place? So have an idea about what you think these these important aspects are going to be. Some general advice from me, from my own experience of grant writing and proposal writing and applications, are that it can be very challenging. Um, but I would, my advice is to stay positive and keep going. There will be disappointments, um, and you can receive many rejections before acceptance. So, in the previous year, I've, I think I've applied for around ten grants um, and had positive outcomes from two of those. And I, it was a stretch of several um, rejections before I actually um, got the positive one that I've been seeking. So it's, it can it can be disappointing, but one of the advice is this is a learning process. You don't go into this with all the skills required to put together the ultimately ultimate best proposal for your research. So always seek feedback and guidance if you aren't successful. And for the most part, the the funders and the 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 app, um, the people you're applying for are very happy to give you pointers about perhaps how to improve your application for next time. And you may be able to submit it again to the next round of their applications with an improved improved and developed proposal. And so don't be put off by that. Always consider engaging with them and asking and keep the conversation going, even if it's not a successful outcome on this particular occasion. Um, also, don't forget to ask colleagues to review what you've done. Um, is there any general advice that they have about what you could do next or how you could improve it? And I think, remember, also keep in mind that it's particularly at the moment a very challenging current research climate. As I mentioned, funding is very difficult at the moment, given the, 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 the crisis that we're all facing around the world. Um, and so funding is in limited supply. So um, just keep going, keep positive, seek advice and keep talking to people is my general advice for this. Certainly some people to think about for potential funders, um, certainly in, based around the UK would be Patholog the Pathological Society of Great Britain. Um, they, they provide a whole series of grants. They're very dedicated to research and very keen to support research and actually have a network, research network and mentorship scheme that's important with. And that's one other aspect that I think is really key with this mentorship. 
if you can establish find someone who you who you have good can have a good relationship with feel comfortable talking about your research and will is prepared to support you and help you develop the skills that you need with that i think that can't be underestimated i think that's a really vital component of the work that you um, you're going to be doing so do uh, do look out for those opportunities and make the most of them talking with others and communicating with others is going to be a key to help you with the success with this other organizations such as the Wellcome Trust, the Academy of Medical Sciences and Cancer Research UK are another groups, other groups, just to name a few, that provide regular research opportunities for those who are perhaps early on in their research careers. And there'll be many others that may be specific and organizations specific to the particular area of research that you're looking at. So do think about those particular organizations, whether that's a specialist organization or others that are engaged with work um, related to your specialty and see whether they have a small grant applications or opportunities that you could potentially apply for. And as I said, there is a desire at the moment to get people more engaged with research. So if you look, make the most of a of um, helping to support that appetite at the moment and engage with them. Um, and you may be find yourself fortunate in getting uh, getting the support you require. So when should you do research? Well, in my opinion, it's never too late to start. And as I said, even if you're not necessarily leading research, um, supporting it in whatever way you can throughout your career is going to be really important for both you and the specialty. Um, and I think that's a decision you need to make, if, particularly early on in your career, whether you want to support research. So it's something that's going to work in parallel with your clinical career, or maybe it's going to be the dominant aspect of it, where you're actually potentially re leading a research team um, and doing high end research that potentially is, is going to be the dominant aspect of your, your, your pathology career. Think about what I can bring to the table. You, as whatever specialty you might be in, have a skill set that's vital to that research team going forward. So don't forget to showcase your skills and what you bring to the research table, as well as seeking other input from other people. And you never know in your role, you may be approached by other people in different research teams for your advice and your opinion about things, which can lead to collaborative opportunities, but also potential other publications and involvement in projects that you may not have thought about before as well. So there's lots of different learning aspects for everybody. I would also strongly urge that there's an important principle within research that I think is championed by everybody, which is equality, diversity and inclusion. Whichever avenue you go down, it should be open to everybody and make make the most. And so there should be no uh, everybody should be able to enter research, no matter their background or who they are. Um, it's, a, it's an open environment for everybody. And I think that's something that as a research community, we're all very keen to foster and ensure um, those who work in research feel the same. Just a word about pressure to publish. Um, I think it can put a lot of people off. I think also people worry about being scooped, which is where another research team may publish very similar data to before you. Um, I think these are these are worries that to, to put people off, but I wouldn't let it detract from the enjoyment and the satisfaction that you can get from research. Publications are just one aspect of the work that you do. Think about your target journal as well. Where are you most likely to get it published? So think about the message that you are showing and what the data is that you're providing. And um, think about where, where you're most likely to get success with that. Think about, you can also, there's a desire often to publish in really high impact factor journals. Um, but there are lots of different journals, again, with different backgrounds and things. So think about how, what impact the, the, the research that you have, um, the, the research for output that you have is going to generate and then try and target according, the, according to the best journal um, that, that you, you're aware of. There's also various different opinions about publishing negative data and negative data is where there may not be the, a positive result from the, the work that you've done. But in my opinion, it's still really valuable to showcase this because it prevents people doing similar research into an area that may not actually be productive in the future. And so I think there's a lot of I think a lot of journals that actually actively say they will publish negative um, negative data and happy to do so. And I think as a research community, we should be, again, promoting the opportunity to do this because it's still valuable and important data um, that we need to make people aware of. There are also now, there's a system where called BioArchive where you can actually publish your, um, put your manuscript and your data and make it available before it's actually published in print. So it helps to ensure that it's out in the community at potentially an early stage, particularly if there may be some important clinical impact derived from it. 
and it can be a long process to publication so you may find that you get rejected from certain journals it may go out for review and then you need to revise it then it's resubmitted re-reviewed more revisions etc so it can be quite a long process be persistent with it and stick with it it's a learning curve and a learning opportunity and actually just learning how to write a paper is one of the key aspects to start with as well but um, I hope you will have the success as well so a little bit about my research journey um, so far. So I came into research really late. Um, so up until I was in my third year of specialty training before an opportunity came to spend six months at the Institute of Cancer Research learning about molecular pathology. And as a result of that, I was allocated to the glioma team, um, who was which was led by Professor Chris Jones. And what turned into what was supposed to be a six month placement ended up into a four and a half for four year PhD. Um, I was allocated a project looking at um, infant high grade gliomas, so a rare group of tumours that occur in very young children. And the project aimed to characterise and classify and understand a little bit more about them, because it had long been known that this tumour, which is normally um, very aggressive and has a very poor, poor prognosis of around two year survival, in the younger children it seems to have a slightly better outcome than those that were older and what my project ended up showing is that in fact they were a, a there is a distinct new type of tumor um, occurring within this population and just to show you this picture um, this is what's called a tsne plot and it's showing methylation data and methyl groups are added at various different positions along a dna strand and back in 2018, it was discovered that if you take the DNA from every type of known brain tumor and look at where the methyl groups are added along that strand, each brain tumor will have a different profile of where these methyl groups are added, which means it's a really valuable potential diagnostic tool to help us. And what you, when plotting the methylation data in this TSNE plot, you can see that, well, each color represents a different tumor type and each dot represents an individual case. So you can see that the tumors in the blue color at the top of the picture here, they're characterized by a particular type of mutation that they contain. And then over to the left-hand side, you can see those labeled red, which again are characterized by another type of mutation. But the ones in the circle were my infant cases, which seem to cluster separately to the other established high-grade glioma entities. And then when I did some further molecular data and, and a sequencing of these cases, I found that in fact those infant cases were enriched for the presence of RTK fusions. So translocations or fusions occurring in the ALK, NTRAC, ROS1 or MET genes. And excitingly, these were the only um, alterations that were occurring um, in these tumors, which means that potentially it was an exciting target to take forward as well. These fusions do occur in other tumors as well and often in a, with a background of other somatic mutations. So it was quite unique, the fact that these that those occurring in the infant population of this particular type of tumour were occurring in isolation. And there were many different fusion partners associated with these key genes. But also when looking at the survival data, there were some interesting um, features where certain fusions indicated a better survival. But also overall, when we compared this new group of tumours, their survival with the um, already the high other typical high grade glioma groups, we found the survival was significantly improved for them. So we seem to have identified the key group of tumors and the key um, survivors in this population. And just here are a couple of examples that were in my published paper about this. And one such example on the right hand side, this was a, a child that was diagnosed in utero. So before they'd even been born with a um, a, a brain tumor. It was biopsied shortly after birth and was identified to be a high grade glioma, so a poor prognosis and very aggressive tumor. A sample was sent um, to our lab and we were able to identify that it contained an NTRAC3 fusion. And from that point onwards, the child was started on a particular TREK inhibitor targeting this fusion. And the residual tumor that hadn't been able to be removed by the operations in fact shrunk and has now disappeared and so that child is now doing remarkably well as at school um, and has a, is a survivor of this so it just shows you how important and what importance of clinical translation can be to this the it's key areas of need like this and as a result of that the latest iteration of the world health organization classification of these tumors and contains a new chapter based on this research as well which is very exciting and also there have now been clinical trials that have been established specifically for these types of tumors with these fusion positive um, char molecular characteristics. And it's also, as I mentioned, other research questions can come from this work. 
um, my work now as a clinical lecturer is focused on a very similar project, but now looking at um, patients who are slightly older, so teenagers and young adults with high-grade gliomas, to again try and identify the different characteristics of the tumours that occur within this population as well. So that's a little trajectory of where I've um, where I've got to. As I mentioned, I was a late starter and came into it quite, I hadn't been involved in research at all really up to that point, but I certainly uh, got the bug and found it absolutely fascinating in that first few months when I when I joined the research team and now it's going to be a part of my my career going forward and forevermore I hope um the molecular I started with a molecular pathology starter program which as I mentioned it was the the six months spent at the ICR that first got me hooked that's led to the clinical fellowship and the PhD and then the clinical lecture lecturer post now as well so next steps for me thinking about whether whether I want to be a team leader or supporting research within my clinical practice as well. These are big questions that are coming on the horizon for me at the moment. Um, and they may be the ones that you may be thinking about going forward as well. Um, but I think the important thing is you can change your perspectives. You can always change your route. And there are lots of different avenues to you for you to support research in any way, shape or form. So do do think about engaging with it. And there are many opportunities to do so. So in summary, um, we need to support our clinical research opportunities as much as we can, um, and the non-clinical as well. There are plenty of opportunities to get involved. Preparation and planning for proposals is key. Give yourself enough time to think it through and talk with others about it. Budget your research carefully. This is often where a lot of applications can fall down. Um, promote your career progression as an opportunity as well. There'll be often within proposals opportunities for you to talk about yourself and what you've done so far. So don't be af afraid to actually showcase um, what the positive aspects of the work that you've done previously in your career up to that point. And remember as well, when you're engaged with research, to engage with teaching, public engagement and social media if you can. These are all good ways of actually giving something back to those that provide a lot of the support for research and the funding for it as well. Um, and enjoy it. Um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. There are challenges. It can be a bit of a roller coaster at times, but I think every job can provide that, um, that instability and unstableness at certain points. But you can, can and will make a difference by engaging with it. So I strongly urge you to consider it if you haven't already done so. And we'll just finish on a quote from Dr. Carl Sagan. Somewhere, something incredible is waiting to be known. Um, and I wish you all the very best um, with your research careers going forward and your research engagement. And thank you very much for listening to this talk. Thank you very much.